All right. Um, Peter Diekel, Dean of the Library, some of you know, asked me to get this started because he's um, in a meeting right now and is working his way over. And uh, rather than make you wait for him to leave a meeting, uh, we'll get started. So, um, and as we all know, he would welcome all of you um, and faculty, staff, members of the, the overall community, um, alumni um, as well. Um, to our first Talking the Library program for this spring. Um, and this one is presented in collaboration with the Creative Writing Program as well. Um, uh, before I introduce Maria, I will also take this time to advertise the next two um, events. Um, uh, the next one is Mon Monday, actually. Actually, the next two are on Mondays, which is uncustomary because uh, typically we do them on Tuesdays. Um, March 23rd will be Johar Ilham, who um, some of you students have heard the story of, uh, the daughter of Ilham Todi, a um, Chinese scholar who is um, in prison in, in China, and his daughter, uh, college-age daughter, your age, has um, been here in the United States for two years, um, very accidentally here, um, and has become a, a really a someone who's had to make a life for herself and advocate for her father at the same time. Um, and a very interesting story, and a very interesting person, a very lovely person too. So she'll be here um, to, um, she told me she's not gonna stand and talk to a bunch of people, but she'll here, be here to um, you know, converse, as it were. Um, and then a last um, uh, talk in the library this season um, will be on April 13th. Uh, which will be a Pulitzer Prize uh, award winner, Paul Harding, who will be here um, as part of the Vermont Fellowship. And that'll be on April 13th. Um, there's also tomorrow, as long as we're just rattling this stuff off. Um, panel discussion on Native Son. Panel discussion on Native Son with Keith Stokes will be here, Dean Isinger, and somebody else from the law school. From the law school. And there's an exhibition on your way in. And there's an exhibition oh, on your way in. Um, and then there will be, uh, you'll get fly, uh, information I'm sure from Professor Soto about the various po National Poetry Month events that will be happening in, a in, in April. Um, okay, and otherwise the general turn off the cell phones kind of stuff um, and we'll get, we'll get going. Okay. Now, now I need the glasses. Um, there are many possible reasons why you may be here this afternoon to listen to Maria Fluke. Maybe you're here because of Maria's poetry, the art form she started in and brought her earliest accolades, notably the Houghton Mifflin New Poetry Series. Or perhaps you're here because of Maria's nonfiction, remembering among other works her fascinating exploration of a murder, a life, and a culture in Invisible Eden, Love and Murder on Cape Cod. Or maybe you've come to Maria through her fiction, novels and short stories, such as her recently released novel, Mothers and Lovers, a narrative about an academic named April, so it's just set here in Rhode Island, who in an effort to uncomplicate her life is pulled by threads of temptation that may become too seductive to resist, uh, which uh, risks, she risks uh, being undone by. Readers of Mothers and Lovers will recognize in Maria's writing the careful choices of a skilled craftswoman in the art of fiction. They will recognize the deep study of the complex push-pull of human instinct versus human consciousness versus human nature. They will recognize humor. They will recognize a level of suspense and tension. And they will recognize a sexiness, both in the writing and in the storyline itself. But, of course, there is another reason why you might be here today to see Maria, and that is that she is an alumna of Roger Williams College. As she told Abby DeVerve in, in an interview on our library's connection site, quote, I was 18, I never graduated high school, and I didn't have a high school diploma. I was admitted into the creative writing program at RWC as, quote, a special student. The letter S appeared after every grade I received on my first report cards until I'd earned enough straight A's to be taken off the special student list. <laughs> I'd been admitted to the course after showing a manuscript to the creative writing instructor, Robert McRoberts. 
He saw that I was doing something interesting with my poetry, and he endorsed my application. Throughout that interview, Maria shares many fascinating experiences of her days at Roger Williams, giving me a glimpse into what life as a student in the creative arts meant here at the time, something that in a world that forever dismantles tradition in favor of the illusion of innovation, we might learn from. I'd encourage you to read the interview when you get the chance. It can be accessed through the library's homepage, again, to the connections. In the meanwhile, for whatever reason you are here, please join me in welcoming Maria Fluke back to Roger Williams. Thank you, Adam. That was a lovely introduction. I, I've been, I met with some of you earlier for an hour, and I really enjoyed meeting you. You seem like really serious, bright students, and I think Adam is lucky to be working with you. I am very happy to be back here. I've been back here a couple times since I was a student here, but this place has really changed. And I was even telling Adam, I was so surprised to see that there's no toll at the bridge. And then he told me it must have been 12 years ago they took the toll away. But you used to always have to come down and pay a little toll. So a lot of things have changed. Um, tonight, I'm going to read some pages from the first chapter or so of this book, Mothers and Lovers, which takes place in Rhode Island. One thing Adam didn't say is that many of my novels take place in Rhode Island. I have a brand new novel, um, which hasn't been published yet, which takes place in Middletown. And that one is called Divorce Dog Style. <laughs> so hopefully that'll get published and uh, I'll be able to share that with you. So I'm going to read uh, maybe about 20 minutes or so from this new novel. And then afterwards, are we going to have a little <coughs> discussion? And so if any of you have any questions about uh, my experience here at R I keep still call it RWC. I can't get used to RWU. But I'm going to try to read this without this being in my way. Okay, it's right in my way. Anyway, let me introduce this novel that I'm going to read to you. I'm going to introduce in the first couple pages the point of view of one of my characters who is a teenage boy, okay? Then I'm going to introduce my other main character who is a young 30-something-year-old college professor. And uh, these two characters meet one another because the college professor has just moved in next door to the teenage boy. So I'll start. He stands beside the highway in a windy bib of waist-high daisies where a sign says, wildflowers do not mow. Last chance bumblebees skim the tossing mop heads and he swats them one by one. A cruiser lounges past him. He dodges the trooper, sinking chin deep in the weeds until its wigwag lights disappear in the distance. Then he's on his feet and pumps his thumb. Cars rip past. Drivers keep moving when they see betwixt and between written all over him. He has the penetrating look of a young man who unfairly suffers the aftermath of something. Pounded by the right lane air wake, he's thinking of her, the way she curled her pinky finger when she wanted him to climb into bed beside her. Another driver peels by, checking his rear view without pity. Blaze twirls around, tilts his arms, and plays airplane to mock him. In the growing dark, they can hardly see him, let, let alone stop in time. Dressed in black jeans and a dark hooded sweatshirt, 
He's almost invisible, his colorless silhouette absorbed by the macadam. Truckers might pull over to save a baby stray, breaking when they think it's a teen who took off in a huff. But when he climbs into the cab and extends his long legs, he's six feet plus. He wears a halo of blue meanies. So they start telling him their own stories to knock him off his high horse. <clears throat> he's heard it all a hundred times. When his last ride dropped him, the driver punched his shoulder as he climbed down, saying, kid, go home. It's crazy to, thl to thumb in funeral clothes. That's just asking pancake. The rig had said, York, Pennsylvania, the barbell capital of the world. The driver had explained that his trailer carried lat bars, curl bars, power lifter bars, and crates of dumbbells. Blaze said, what's the difference between a dumbbell and a barbell? I guess a dumbbell doesn't know the difference. Blaze looked out the windshield to see a vanity plate preaching T-H-N-K-G-O-D. Think God. Yeah, right. Son, that, sa that tag says, thank God. Where do you come from? <clears throat> After the hearing that afternoon, he had left the courthouse in the county van. Heading back to the Minimax in Cranston, he saw his chance. Stopped at a no right on red, he crashed through the window of the bubbler GMC after peeling back the rubber gasket. He pried its lip, popped it loose, and swung his legs out first like a monkey. He was a tall drink of ne neon in his juvie hall jumpsuit with two officers in pursuit. He lost them behind a strip mall, and when he climbed into a Stal Salvation Army bin on chalk blocks, he wormed under the heap of tangled clothes, waiting for, them, waiting for them to crawl in after him. They didn't go in. He buried his hot pink pajamas in the giveaway vault and walked away in his secondhand jeans. Standing on the rumble strip, he pictures her again. Ruby bubbles of foam sputtered on her lips. Wet red paisleys had bloomed on the top sheet, her body still warm when he left her. Just then, a big Kenworth call ha car hauler downshifts and veers into the breakdown lane. The semi doesn't stop. It plows straight into the wildflower patch, beheading a section of daisies like a monster weed whacker aiming for the tallest bloom. That would be him. The trucker blasts his direct compressor air horn, two shorts and then the long, and blurs into the straightaway again, never slowing down. Blaze rolls clear just in time, pinging his collarbone. Brushing thistles off his jeans, he sees more trouble coming. From out of the twilight, about 50 yards away on the apron of the highway, it's already gaining on him. A freak creature lopes in wild pounces, heading right for him. A big silver dragon, half animal, half alloy, like an Xbox serpent or something from a Terminator movie. He doesn't wait to see. He sprints down the breakdown lane, but the dragon gallops abreast of him, hissing and rattling its scales. It's just a loop of flame-proof dryer hose, a squirming, squirming tube of shiny accordion foil that tumbles with the wind. A cast-off, just like him, an escapee, unattached to any legitimate dwelling or proper situation. <clears throat> In the morning, 
the mountain was higher. New deliveries of sludge arrived after dark. She heard the diesel as it downshifted and turned into her neighbor's lot. When she pulled her curtain to look outside, the driver cut his beams. He wasn't fooling anyone. The stuff was supposed to be rich fertilizer for weekend gardeners and gentlemen farmers who puttered in their backyards on Sundays. Hazmat authorities monitored the transfer of cured waste coming from sewage treatment plants in Boston and Providence. But there was something sinister about the substance. It sifted, steamed, and bubbled as if it were alive. April had already called Town Hall to complain. She was new in town, and she was shuffled from one phone <coughs> number to the next. She had recent, recently moved from Providence to East Westerly, a little backwoods hamlet once known for its productive granite quarries. Its comic oppositional name, East Westerly, was its most famous distinction and a statewide joke. If someone went off his rocker or had lost his marbles, Rhode Islanders would often say, he's gone east westerly. <laughs> she wore a raincoat over her clingy nightgown and stepped into her furry boots. She walked outside into the cold pewter half-light near dawn, but the dump truck was gone. Watching where she placed each step, she circled the apron of the newly replenished heap. It was starting to drift and topple into her drive. She was surprised to see she wasn't alone. A figure stood in the doorway of the place next door. Her neighbor's teenage son had been sent home from reform school and was living with his father under house arrest to await his next scheduled family court date later that spring. Weekdays, the local school bus rolled past at 6.30, but didn't stop for him. He was tall and slender, only a shadow in the poor light. She couldn't see his face behind a long curtain of dark hair. Even in his hiding spot, the kid oozed a lot of attitude. He stamped his boot heel several times, as if to kill a spider. He was nearly snuffing a cigarette. He smoked menthols. She had noticed some of these white, white cool butts sprinkled along the worn path that made a desire line between their properties. The kid prowled the path and flicked his burning stubs willy-nilly. Mentholated brands were popular in prison. The minty rush of flavoring adds an extra jolt. She imagined that in the monotony of the day-by-day -day lockup, inmates seek every extra jolt they can get. The boy turned to look in her direction. He was giving her the up and down. He didn't have a greeting. This is what she had to deal with, not so much as a hello, how are you? She looked at the hill of biofertilizer, tiny funnel, funnels of mist erupted over its bulk like wriggling ghost worms. Back in her kitchen, she started her coffee machine and washed last night's dinner plate at her double sink. She dried her silverware and put it away. She was finicky and kept her teaspoons and tablespoons separated in parallel bins with the teaspoons facing the opposite way of the tablespoons, bowl to stem. When she opened the silverware drawer, she'd never reach for the wrong one. If only she could use the same precaution as she sorted her personal affairs, and her contracts with people could be managed and monitored, held at bay, bowl to stem. She had moved to the country trying to extract herself from an affair with a married man. He was the provost at Sinclair College, where she was a faculty member. But it disturbed her that they had shared the same embarrassing email address, because she and her lover 
Both worked at Sinclair College. Their emailed love notes, notes were exchanged to and from sin.edu. The email address sin.edu seemed to mock their illicit relationship. She decided to leave town in order to distance herself from him. She couldn't stay in the city and be single again. She told her friends, I refuse to become a crone in a condo. Not yet 40, April was a long way off from that. But she was alarmed to come across the C word in the dictionary and to find out that the derivation for the word crone was carrion. April opened her freezer door and took out two previously steeped tea bags from the ice cube bin, little pillows of green slush. She walked into the parlor and collapsed on her sofa. She was hatching a headache. She closed her eyes and placed the frozen tea bags on her eyelids. She was certain that the increase in her morning headaches must be caused by this toxic sludge pile. The tea bag trip trick sometimes worked wonders. She tried to rest, but someone was tapping the brass door knocker in flurries of clinks and clanks. She put the soggy tea bags in a saucer and went to see who it was. The unexpected visitor kept banging on the door. She had thought it might be the provost, arriving for one of his rare, small and early surprise visits but it was a newcomer. He had one foot already wedged on the threshold as she pulled the front door open. Halfway inside already, he stood there uninvited. Shoulder length hair framed a very pretty, yet solidly square jawed face. His skin so white, he looked pale as a geisha. It was the boy from next door. Oh, it's you, she said, in her neutral and tolerant schoolteacher's voice. She didn't invite him to come in. <clears throat> I'm testing my cuff, he said, as he brushed past her and walked into the foyer. You're doing what? Testing the hardware. Your cuff? My virtual arrest solution. You know, it's got its stamp of approval from the American Civil Liberties Union. You have to wear that electronic device, she said. He showed her a rubberized cinch snapped onto his ankle. It's a wireless tamper-proof transmitter, he said. It shoots to the outer space satellite, back to the cell tower, and then to the monitoring center. Shoots what? Every move you make, he said. I can't leave the property without sending an alarm to Big Brother. I'm surrounded by an invisible fence, just like a dog pen. She wondered what drug he was taking, maybe Ritalin, that made him such a motor mouth. She had learned that students who spend a lot of energy explaining themselves are not to be trusted. He said, if I'm not where I'm supposed to be, it pops onto a screen and those Betsy's alert my PL. Then he calls my dad, or he calls the state police. Those fucks. How long do you have to wear it, she said. I'm short time now. If I get any add-on time at the training school, these dog pen months count against my sentence. Well, you're not very locked up now, she said. That's the beauty part. You're inside the radius. It's good here, he said. And here. He inched into her parlor. He walked in tiny bride steps until he was all the way into the room. April followed on his heels. Then he turned around. He grinned. Oh, he said, I should introduce myself. I'm Blaze. He extended his hand. When she reached out to shake hands with him, he licked his palm, grabbed her hand, and pumped it up and down. She was surprised by the flash of his pink tongue, followed by his cool, wet tug. He had tricked her. He was making a crude joke at her expense, but her wave of repulsion felt more like a thrill. 
he plopped down on her sofa, brushing her saucer of wet tea bags onto the floor. What's with the tea bags, he said. I thought I smelled coffee. She didn't offer him a cup of coffee. He put his arms behind his head. We're golden, he said. Golden? You mean that sofa is within the confinement map? It's safe? You tell me, is it safe? She looked at him in awe. He was acting like a precocious Casanova, and he seemed as confident as his elder, the sludge tycoon next door. She wondered if the kid had learned it from his father. Other men might talk to her like this, but they were usually hat acts, all talk and no real threat. He leaned back on the sofa, resting his long arms against its sloping back. Is this a fainting couch, he said. It's so antiques roadshow. Not a fainting couch, no. It's French empire, she said. She understood his confusion because the antique French settee had a sculpted back that was higher on one side before it dipped gracefully to the lower end, like the matronly curve of a hip. The settee was very feminine. Teen boys and grown men looked almost silly sinking into the cushions. She could have told him that real fainting couches were popular when ladies wore tight corsets and they often collapse from poor, poor circulation. She said, Antiques Roadshow, you say? Do you really, did you really watch PBS in jail? No, we liked the map channel, he said. Oh, you mean National Geographic? I like that too. No, M-A-P, Mature Amateur Porn, my favorite. I guess that's why you look familiar, he said. She felt a queasy pleasure tug in her stomach. It was a silly insult, or perhaps it was a backhanded compliment. She tried to ignore it. <clears throat> this is nice, I like it, he said, patting the sofa cushion. It's comfy, so in the olden days, why did women faint so much? Like I said, it's not a fainting couch, but go, but go ahead, be my guest. Feel free if you want to faint. He reached out and grabbed her wrist. No, you will. You're going to faint all you want. He smiled, staring into her face. She tugged her hand away, watching him more closely. His eyes were colder when his mouth was shut. She sensed a raw fear under his silence. His chiseled expression looked older than 15 or 16. He was a hardened animal, right out of a jungle of small cons and headaches that she didn't want to imagine. But he jabbered like a sugar jazz kindergartner. He had plopped down on her couch like a kid ready to watch Saturday cartoons. Men are happy to kick off their shoes, wingtips or Nikes. Once shoeless, when they are in their rumpled socks, they are like innocents. Men often sleep where they finish, in bed, on the settee. Her fantasies were fiction, but felt good, swarming through her mind. She'd savor them later when writing in her bedside journal with its velvet board covers. She had learned that velvet covers kept her journal from sliding off the bed. These, old, these unwholesome thoughts were in direct response to her current dead-end affair with the provost. But she didn't know what to do with the teenager. If he was really under house arrest, she wasn't supposed to babysit him. She said, so what's the story with the bracelet? He locked eyes with her. You really want to know? OK, I'll tell you. It's called aggravated assault. She didn't exactly know what characterized an aggravated attack. Boys always fought about girls 
She didn't want to imagine drugs, armed robbery, or something worse. He said, I see that Camry has a moon roof. That's a nice feature. She realized that his unauthorized plop down might be because he wanted her wheels. She warned him, that car is a lemon. Every time I park the thing, its tail lights won't turn off. So I have to remove a fuse from underneath the dash with the needle nose pliers to shut the lights off. The mechanic had told her it would be $1,500 to replace a circuit panel. So for the time being, she would have to drive the beater. She said, sometimes I drop the fuse behind the dash and I can't find it. They're tiny. I could find your fuse, he said. She recognized his sexual antagonism. It was a turn off or a turn on. She didn't want to decide. She said, do you know when your dad is planning to move that sludge pile? It's like that B movie, The Blob. He told her, you're right. That mound is like an X-file. It's like Stephen King compost. He was mocking her. Sweared, he said, smearing the words. Yeah, I'd keep an eye out. Things can happen like house drops on witch he said. The boy had stretched out on her sofa. He was reclaiming his space. He said, my mom ditched me to run off with a contractor who builds strip malls. Whore, he said, imitating the cold jargon he must have heard on TV shows or maybe at the kiddie prison. You don't get along with your mom, she said. Bitch doesn't pass the food bowl test. April had met his mother a few times, but she didn't recognize the reference he was making. He said, you know how the SP ASPCA evaluates shelter dogs? The trainer reaches for the food bowl with a plastic arm. If the dog bites the arm, end of story. His icy summary of his mother's vicious streak was disturbing. But, but his, absurd, his absurd invention of the food bowl metaphor seemed shockingly authentic. He shifted on the sofa, stretching his legs out. She rescued a hand-embroidered pillow from under his dirty shoes. Hey, are you going to be sociable? He patted the velvet seat cushion. As a college professor, her male students sometimes tried to find a chink in her armor. They watched her closely as she walked between the tight tables in the classroom, trying not to bump her hips against the crowded chairs. She just looked too curvy. On the, web, on the website ratemyprofessors.com, where students critique teachers, she'd often been awarded a little red icon beside her name a hot pepper. But Blaze was way ahead of her. His silly insults had confused her, first with his wet handshake, and next with comments she might have heard before, but always from a seasoned player, not from a kid. He didn't want to seem to leave. April finally told him, you have to go. I've got to meet my class. You work at Sin, he asked. Yeah, I heard. She hated it when people lopped off the second syllable of Sinclair College. The slang nickname had special meaning to her because of her illicit connection to the provost. OK, I'm going, Blaze said. He rolled slowly off the sofa in one languorous collapse to her carpet. Seduced by his dreaminess, artificial or not, she walked into the kitchen door with added formality. She tried to regain control by relying on her ladylike decorum. It was very nice to meet you, Blaze, she said. Thanks for stopping by. She watched him walk down the path to the driveway where her car was parked. He stopped to peer into his driver's side window, steepling his hands as he pressed his nose to the glass. 
Her Camry looked a little shabby. It had doilies of rust on its front fender. And of course, she had to remove a fuse each time she parked it. Blaze turned and smiled at her. He was twirling something on his pointer finger. She recognized the little flat, flat plastic cube of her lock beeper. He had pocketed her car keys. She always left her car keys on the kitchen counter. Despite her description of its electrical problems, she had left her, oh, what a feeling Toyota right there on a silver platter. Blaze had already climbed into the Camry. He had found the needle nose pliers in the cup holder and replaced the fuse. Sinking into the driver's seat with a comfortable grin, he cranked the ignition. It purred. He towed the gas and rolled the car in a half circle around April, avoiding the empty flower beds, steering clear of their borders. The Camry peeled down the country lane, its gears shifting smoothly, responding to its young driver like an all too willing cohort. The car smelled of honey or vanilla. April had dropped her grocery bag and her herbal shampoo had spilled on the car floor, soaking the rug. The sugary pastille was intoxicating and he imagined his new neighbor. He saw her body. She's wearing nothing but a crimson thong. He saw her face. He followed it onto the highway. Thanks. from Providence. And um, I noticed in, in, um, in your reading that you kind of went around Rhode Island. Um, during like your writing process, do you feel like you have to go back and like kind of back travel to just kind of remember where the journey oh, you that you're writing about? Oh, you go revisit places? Yeah. Um, I have in certain instances revisited places. When I wrote uh, my novel, Open Water, which takes place in Newport, where I lived for many years, I did have to go back and check a couple things. I had to go back to a cemetery in Middletown that had the strangest uh, little area of places where they buried babies. And they had this wonderful plaque that um, was like the title of the baby cemetery. And I can't remember exactly the wording, but it, I needed to go back to that cemetery to actually find the, the right wording. And I went back to the baby cemetery, and it was sort of changed. And there was somebody working there, and I said, where's the baby cemetery? And they said, well, we're not advertising it anymore. They're still on the ground, but we don't want to advertise it's full of babies. And then he showed me the plaque that used to be there, because they had it in the back. They had taken it off and moved it around. And so that's an instance where I did go back to make sure I was, knew what I was talking about. But um, this new novel that I just wrote about uh, that takes place in Middletown, I didn't really need to go back, because I, I wrote it, and it takes place in, in sort of one house on the Sakonet River, and I knew it so well, I really didn't feel I needed to go back. But I know things are always changing and for writers, you should always return if you have questions or if you want to be re-inspired, you know, it's good to turn back. Awesome. Anybody else have a question? Um, I noticed in, in your writing you talked a lot about very specific things about Rhode Island, like sp specific things to like people who are from here. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you write about a, another place, how do you research that and try to find things that make it as real as you can make Rhode Island? Well, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, I've written about other places as well by a novel. Lux is a Cape Cod novel. It's the first Cape Cod novel I ever wrote. 
And what was interesting about that was um, I had written the novel Lux. I had completed it right before I was assigned um, my nonfiction book about a murder in Truro. And in that book, I had to describe um, the Cape Cod landscape because, you know, um, out where that is, everything is controlled by the sea. The sea is basically the whole setting. And um, I was sort of upset because I had written this whole novel, Lux, that took place on Cape Cod, and I really described Cape Cod. And then I had to write another book about Cape Cod, and I had to describe Cape Cod again, but I couldn't describe it with the same descriptions I had described it the first time. So I had to, I mean, if you put the two books together, I never repeated myself. I described Cape Cod afresh the second time around. But I mean, um, being a writer, you just have to be observant. You have to see what a setting presents to you. And it doesn't just present um, what it appears to present. It doesn't just present its physical wonder, but it goes inside you and it becomes an interior kind of presence, you know, a, a setting, right? And that's why when I come back to Rhode Island, it's very interior to me to be back in these um, places that I know so well and that have sort of a psychic or emotional component to me. Yes? I'm, uh, I was uh, struck by your choice of words. You were assigned the book. Mm -hmm. How does that come about? Uh, well, there were editors at Random House who thought I would be somebody who would be able to tackle that project, so they called me up and asked me if I wanted to to write a book about the murder. And I said, let me think about it. But it was a story that was fascinating to me. And I knew several of the people involved personally. And it sort of was like a story with my name on it. So I took the project on. Thank you. Yes? Um, on that book, on that subject, I know after the book came out, mm -hmm. you became very much part of the story, right? Yeah. But Oh, well, well, actually, when I was writing the book, I was a little part of the story, but I didn't speak to the press. Uh, I had a wonderful, uh, um, my editors and the um, press people at Random House said, don't talk to the press before the publication of the book. So anytime anybody tried to talk to me about it, I just wasn't talking. But amongst the community, I was known for somebody who had the, the, the gall to write a book about the tragic murder, you know, so I did get a lot of flack, you know, from it. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, what about Chris McGowan? Do you want to write about him? And finish oh yeah, that story? I I actually. Um, I actually was writing uh, uh, for a new edition of that book, all about Chris McCowan, and and they and they and Random House decided not to do it because of legal issues. Because of legal issues, yeah. But I had actually had uh, had done a lot of research with Chris, and I knew Chris pretty well. He 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 called me from the prison all the time. He told me his story and everything. Um, so I was writing about. It. I was going to write about him. Um, but Random House got um, wind of some legal problems, so, so they didn't want to do it. Do you think he did it? Yes, I know he did it. <laughs> I have no question. And I'll tell you why, because um, this is a lot of facts a lot of you people don't know. This man, prior to the murder, had five separate restraining orders from women who he had previously beaten. He was a violent man. He beat all of his girlfriends to a pulp, though he didn't kill them, and then he killed Krista. This was a violent man who was out of control. And um, I don't believe uh, that the decision to convict him was incorrect. Oh, I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> why, why wasn't any of that? Because those things are actually sealed. 
and they were not even able, they were not even able to use them in the court case. Believe it or not, that, isn't that in crazy? Isn't that crazy? Like no, but I mean, they couldn't even use his restraining orders in the court case, even though they were on the books of the courts, because this murder. Uh, you cannot accuse somebody of murder because of his past uh, restraining orders. It's, it's nutty. And again, I'm no expert in criminal law, but I did learn a lot about it um, going over this. I went to the trial. I went to every day of the trial, and um, and I did come to my and I had my I had my curiosity about like who had killed Crystal Worthing and who could it have been. There were so many different suspects, you know. But the more I learned and the more I found out about it, I believe it was pretty clear that uh, Christopher McCowan probably killed her. And the, and the reason he probably killed her was he knocked her out in a fight. And because he was on parole, if, if she woke up and called the cops and reported <coughs> him, he'd be back in jail. So he murdered her so she couldn't really tell on him. What a downer. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to see you all here and to meet you all. And uh, I wish you great, great success with all your writing. And I wish that you would figure out a way to bring spring. <laughs> Somebody told me that the daylight savings is in just two weeks. Is that right? Oh, nice. Well, that's hopeful anyway. Is that it? Thank you. Is everybody okay? Anybody have anything else to say? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody.